When we lived in the Bay Area, we lived in the Bay Area before we moved here, we loved to take, uh, we loved to take our son to the Oakland Zoo. The Oakland Zoo has, is, is pretty rad. And I remember one time in particular, Ethan might have been like two or three, we took him, I think it was the tiger cage or something. And we're like, Ethan, look at the tiger. Isn't that cool? He's like, yeah. Can I punch it? <laughs> Only once? Like, right? Is is in that moment that we learned the value of conditional statements. If you punch a tiger, it will eat you, right? Like, and so and so I thought it would be fun to kind of start this morning off just by playing that that if-then game. I asked some of my friends on Facebook to give me a few, and here are some of the things that they said. If you throw a green rock into the Red Sea, then it gets wet. Uh, if one person said, if I cut my bangs, then it's a cry for help. <laughs> this is a good one. If the Dodgers go to the World Series, then they will probably lose. <laughs> Poor Dodgers. Uh, if you, this is a good one. If you line up all the veins, arteries, and capillaries from a man's body end to end, that man will die. <laughs> And for all you Seahawks, Seahawks fans, if the Seahawks would have run the ball, they would have had two Super Bowl wins. Burn. Uh, or even, you know, the classic one, and I thought about reading this this morning, is if you give a mouse a cookie, then he will ask for a glass of milk. And so I thought it would be fun to play that game for a bit, but then also to do it with our hymn that we've been going through all Advent season, O Holy Night, and play the if-then game. Uh, before we do that, though, if you'll indulge me, I'm a huge history fan, and I, uh, I really appreciate understanding, uh, you know, things like this, like where this song came from, how has it affected people. Um, so if you bear with me, I got a little video. It gives the history of O Holy Night, and then uh, it's about five minutes, and then we'll play the if-then game with this hymn. So hit the video. A strange and fascinating story of O Holy Night began in France. In 1847, Placide Capot was a poet in a small French town. As a non-religious man, he was probably shocked when his parish priest asked him to pen a poem for Christmas Mass. In a dusty coach traveling down a bumpy road to France's capital city, Placide Capot considered the priest's request. Using the Gospel of Luke as his guide, he imagined witnessing the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Thoughts of being present on that blessed night inspired him, and by the time he arrived in Paris, Cantique de Noël had been completed. Moved by his own work, he decided this was not just a poem, but a song in need of a master musician's hand. Not musically inclined himself, the poet turned to one of his friends, Adolphe Adam, for help. As a man of Jewish ancestry, for Adolphe, the words of Cantique de Noël represented a day he didn't celebrate and a man he did not view as the Son of God. Nevertheless, Adam quickly went to work, adding a beautiful original score to compose powerful words. Adam finished work, pleased both poet and priest, the song was performed just three weeks later at a midnight mass on Christmas Eve. Initially, Cantique de Noël was wholeheartedly accepted by the church in France, and the song quickly found its way into various Christmas services. But when Capot walked away from the faith and became a part of the socialist movement, and church leaders discovered that Adam was a Jew, the song, which had quickly grown to be one of the most beloved Christmas songs in France, was suddenly and uniformly banned by the church. However, a decade later, a reclusive American writer brought it to a whole new audience halfway around the world. John Sullivan Dwight not only felt that America needed to hear this carol, there was something else in the song that moved him beyond the story of the birth of Christ. As an ardent abolitionist, Dwight strongly identified with the lines of the third verse, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. The text supported Dwight's own view of slavery in the South. His English translation of O Holy Night quickly found favor in America, especially in the North during the Civil War. Back in France, 
Legend has it that on Christmas Eve 1871, in the midst of fierce fighting during the Franco-Prussian War, a French soldier suddenly jumped out of his muddy trench. Both sides stared at the seemingly crazed man. Boldly standing with no weapon in his hand or at his side, he lifted his eyes to the heavens and sang the opening lines of Cantique de Noël. After completing all three verses, a German infantryman climbed out of his hiding place and answered with a few robust verses of a sacred German carol. The story goes that the fighting stopped for the next 24 hours while the men on both sides observed a temporary peace in honor of Christmas Day. The song's legacy continued on Christmas Eve 1906 as Reginald Fezenden, a 33-year-old university professor, did something long thought impossible. Using a new type of generator, Fezenden spoke into a microphone and for the first time in history, a man's voice was broadcast over the airwaves. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, he began in a clear, strong voice. Shocked radio operators on ships and astonished wireless owners at newspapers sat slack-jawed as their normal coded impulses were replaced by a professor reading from the Gospel of Luke. It must have seemed like a miracle hearing a voice somehow transmitted to those far away. Some might have believed they were hearing the voice of an angel. After finishing his recitation of the birth of Christ, Fezenden picked up his violin and played, Oh Holy Night, the first song ever sent through the air via radio waves. When the carol ended, so did the broadcast, but not before music had found a new medium that would take it around the world. Since that first rendition at a small Christmas Mass in 1847, O Holy Night has been sung millions of times in churches in every corner of the world. And since the moment a handful of people first heard it played over the radio, the carol has gone on to become one of the most recorded and played spiritual songs. This incredible work, requested by a forgotten parish priest, written by a poet who would later split from the church, given soaring music by a Jewish composer, and brought to the Americans to serve as much as a tool to spotlight the sinful nature of slavery as to tell the story of the birth of a savior? Yes, it has become one of the most beautiful, inspired pieces of music ever created. So we have been uh, going through this hymn all Advent long, and it has been uh, just a joy to kind of go through some of the, the critical lines that have been transformational to generations and generations and generations. Um, so let's play the, the if-then game as we walk through uh, the song to get to the, to the end, which is his power and glory evermore proclaim. So we talked about long lay the world in sin and error, pining the world is broken. Let me just admit it. Um, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. So if the world is broken, then God won't let us stay that way. And the birth of Jesus shows us that God did not desert us fall on our knees. Well, if he won't let us stay that way, then he will ask us to be honest with ourselves and confess our need. And so we realize that the way through brokenness is through confession. Chains shall he break. If we confess our need, then he will set us free from sin and death. And so a way out is offered through God's forgiving power. If uh, or his law is love and his gospel is peace. If he sets us free from sin and death, then he will ask us to be loving and peaceful to others. And he's offered us a new way of living. Christ the Lord, Christ is the Lord, praise his name forever. If we seek to be loving and peaceful, then Christ is our Lord and we have a new master. And that leads us to this, his power and glory evermore proclaimed. If Christ is our Lord, then we have a job to do. If Christ is our Lord, then we have a responsibility to proclaim God's power and glory forever. 
O Holy Night has been a beautiful hymn, and it tells the story of that first Christmas, but the end of the song is a declaration of what the church should be and should do to proclaim the power and glory of God. Now, uh, proclaiming God's power and glory after God has done amazing things is pretty consistent in Scripture. Uh, there's uh, a part in First Chronicles where the Ark of the Covenant, something sacred to the Israelite nation, is returned to its capital city in Jerusalem amidst a very difficult time where uh, tensions between two parts of the country were, were kind of uh, going at each other. And David returns the Ark, and he, uh, he says this, in chapter 16, it says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He continues, he says, Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. David saw... Uh, the power of God uniting a nation in a very difficult time. But even still in the New Testament, in Matthew, after Jesus gives the, the Sermon on the Mount and talks about what a blessing it is to be a part of God's family and to serve the Lord, he offers this command. He says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus challenges his, father, his followers to proclaim God's power and glory. So if we're called to proclaim God's power and glory, we're going to play this game a lot, then um, we should probably examine where God's power has been at work in our life. Um, now, I won't proclaim power in something until I've experienced it. So I was very late to jump on the camera phone bandwagon. I remember in college, they came out. I'm like, this is dumb. Like, why can't I just use my camera? Um, and the cameras weren't great on a phone anyways. And, and everyone's like, no, this is great. This is going to be awesome. I'm like, no. Until I got a camera phone. I'm like, okay, you're right. This is, this is helpful. Um, I can only carry a phone now. Oh, or, or Captain America movies. I've never... I've never seen the power in those. In fact, Captain America is always kind of whiny to me. And so some people are like, oh, it's glorious. It's the best movies. I'm like, nope, it's not. There's a lot of things wrong with Captain America movies. Anyways, um, so just we, the, but things I proclaim God at work in my life, or I've seen God's power. Um, just being alive is one of them. I, it's, I, and, and being healthy at this point in my life. Um, I know that that is a gift. I had no... Um, no power in creating myself whatsoever. So, so that's something. Or, or just, um, uh, or just being forgiven by God is another thing. Knowing that I've messed up and God forgives me, or or having other people forgive me in my life as well. Knowing that relationships could have been broken and yet God at work in someone else has uh, saved our relationship just by forgiving each other. Those are things I give power to, or give glory to God. But I think maybe the biggest one. Um, as I look back, and I think I've shared this here, but forgive me if you've heard it, is uh, when my daughter Isabella was born, um, we, we don't, I can't remember exactly what happened, but we got a report that uh, there was something wrong with her blood, and she was going to have to get blood transfusions for like three months, and she was going to have to stay in the hospital, and um, we're like, dang, that, that is just, that was just a blow to both Carrie and I, and I remember we called our family, we called our friends, and, and, um, and they're like, well, what can we pray? And we're like, well, let's just can you just pray that it was a mistake? That, you know, the doctor would come in and go, it was a mistake, and we can take Isabella home. And so we prayed that, and about half an hour later, the doctor walks in and goes, it was a mistake! And I was like, yes! And at first, I was angry because they still they had admitted her into, like, the special hospital, and I was going to have to pay that bill. But it was only, like, a day's worth, and not, like, three months' worth. So, but I look back and go, that was God's power at work um, in the life of our daughter. And she's beautiful and healthy and running around in California right now. Um, but what is it for you? Like, what is, where has God shown up in your life and, sh and, 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 and his power has been something you can go, and God was there. Here's some, here's some ways that I, maybe you can frame it. Uh, where has God created something for you? Or where has God recreated something for you? So has, uh, God has created maybe your family. 
um, or your life or an opportunity um, to, to prosper or to serve others or um, to, to be in a field that, that just gives you life? Uh, what, is, what is something God has created for you? Or what has God recreated? Uh, maybe a renewed relationship with someone. Um, that had uh, the relationship had gone sour, but because of God's forgiving work, you have a, a new relationship with a son or daughter, a mother, father, something, friend, um, or is it just a renewed relationship with God, where you had turned your back and now you, you realize that God was always there with welcoming arms, um, inviting you back, or just a renewed hope in a situation uh, that's going on in your life. What has God created or recreated for you? And I think that's where you could find, begin to find God's power at work. The reality is that he has done the very thing that we fail to do and will never do, and that's break the power of sin and death in our life. And that is the kind of power worth celebrating and worth giving glory to. But um, if uh, we are to, called to proclaim God's power and glory, then I think we should also examine the other things that we give glory to and maybe realign it to on a more appropriate way of, of living because we all give glory to something or someone. It's, it's how we're made. We're made to worship something. Um, giving glory to someone is giving someone high renown or honor. It's like that five-star review on like a Yelp page. Um, but this is something in our DNA to give glory. It, even we even defend things that we deserve, think deserve glory when we feel that glory is being attacked. Um, if you don't believe me, if I were to tell you Russell Wilson isn't that good of a quarterback, <laughs> what? No, no, you should. And I agree, he's actually a really good quarterback. But we do that. We 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 admire people from afar. We appreciate what they do, and we give them glory and honor. And and that's. It's all right. I mean, but but when it takes uh, away from you know giving glory to you know the the one who's done the most in our life, um, that's where things get dangerous. But we do we give we give glory and and honor to athletes, celebrities, champions, politicians, actors and actresses, religious leaders, even authors, YouTube stars, video game celebrities. There's this guy named Ninja. His mom didn't name him Ninja, but he makes tons of money just playing video games. <laughs> And all the kids just know who he is, um, but and they give glory to him. Uh, we uh, do me a favor. Just imagine life without a rating system, like not on Facebook, not on YouTube, not on Yelp or Airbnb. Like where we just didn't rate anything. It's hard to imagine because that's just how we are. Um, we we like to rank things and give glory where glory is due. Uh, but we don't just rate other people. We also give, uh, or we don't give glory to other people. We give glory to other things as well. Remember that one time that you got so into essential oils and you're like, yeah, these things are the best. Um, or, or, if, or how about In-N-Out Burger for you fellow Californians? You're like, that animal style is so glorious, right? Um, or movies or restaurants. Uh, we give glory to those, or even memories and moments that we've experienced together. And we, we look back and we're like, oh, that was glorious moment. It's just what we do. We also give glory to ourselves. That's probably one of the more dangerous ones. Um, when, we're, when we value our own freedom and our, intellig our own intelligence and our own comfort and the power we have to, to orchestrate that kind of life, um, it just feels good. Uh, winning in that way feels good. Success in your job or in your career or any other goal that you have, it just feels good. Um, we give glory to ourselves in that. Look at me. What's funny is humans are weird because we also give glory when we're suffering to ourselves. Again, because I, I, I don't like that game. It's the who's in pain more game. Um, and it's just backwards and twisted that we do that. I remember when uh, uh, paradise, the fires happened in paradise and the whole town was destroyed. And man, that just, we, we prayed for them. We, um, we, I know I think firefighters from all over went to go like help fight that fire and it happens but I remember friends in the Bay Area seeing their Facebook page like oh my gosh the smoke I just can't breathe it's like there's a town that just burned down and I mean yes it's smoky it's dangerous but still like we just play that game like oh I'm suffering more I'm like no you're not um and we do that. We uh, and I personally have fallen in the early on the, the youth pastor glory trap, like wanting to be a, a a glorified youth pastor, like having a couple books, being a nationally known speaker. And it happened like like I think two years into it, I'm like, oh, I know what I'm doing. Like I, I'm I know I'm I'm connected into I know all the famous other youth pastors. And one, day, you know what? I'm going to train other youth pastors to be better youth pastors. Like now, and I look back at I look at people that have just started youth ministry. And I'm like. Mm. You don't know anything. Um, 
you, you got to put it in at least 10 years before I'll listen to you. Um, just because there, there's, there's a learning process, but we think highly of ourselves. I know, I know I have. Um, so where do you give glory? And do you need to realign it? Because if Christ is Lord, then he should get the glory. Not to say that we can't like things that aren't Jesus, and it's just too narrow-minded, that's not what I'm saying, but, but uh, know that giving glory to something or someone identifies you in a certain grouping. And, and when we choose to give glory to Christ, it identifies us as people who have experienced the power of God in our life, a power unlike any other. So how do we proclaim God's power and glory? Well, we're going to take a look at uh, the early church in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. We'll walk through it a bit. Um, and just to set this up, this comes right after Jesus had lived his life and did his ministry and uh, healed people and taught people, died on the cross, rose from the dead, gave some final instructions, ascended back into heaven. And uh, Christianity is just getting started in this new way. It, it, was, it came from Jewish roots, but now there's this Jesus guy, um, and they're trying to figure out uh, who they are now. And they're doing it in the face of, 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 some, of some obstacles. So there's an emperor at this time called Nero who uh, blamed the Christians for this, this, this fire that ravaged the, the city in, in the year 64. The next emperor, Domitian, demanded that he be worshipped as Lord and God. And so before the early church was this this, they had to remember their if-thens. Wait, wait, wait. If, if Christ is Lord, then no, Domitian, you're not Lord. Or if Christ is Lord, then, then we can't just back down when we face persecution because God is bigger than these things. And so this was the struggle of the early church. And so in Acts 2, uh, they're, they're celebrating. They're, they're having a, a party called Pentecost, and I'll read it. This is verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So Pentecost was a harvest festival. It celebrated the beginning of a wheat harvest in the springtime. And priests would offer fresh bread made from the freshly collected uh, uh, barley and offer it to the Lord. It was also a pilgrim festival. People from all over the Roman Empire would come to Jerusalem and celebrate. And everything would shut down, kind of like Gig Harbor after 8 p.m., where nothing happens. Um, uh, and, they, and, they, and they celebrated what God had done. But this was different because on this day, not only did they give to the Lord, but God gave to them. He gave his people the Holy Spirit. Um, and since then, uh, uh, the, the church has, has, has is, we, we say this is the, 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 birth, the birthday of the church where, uh, where, where the Spirit of God and the church move forward with their mission. Um, and it's kind of a Kind of an awkward situation to kind of come across. So pick up, back up with me in verse five. It says, uh, now they were, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. We just talked about that. And when we heard this sound, a crowd came over in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is that that each of us hears them in our own native language? All right, here we go. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, uh, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, ooh, nailing it, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, ah, oh, they've had too much wine. So, oh, that's, yeah. Um, so so the speaking of tongues, it's noted in Scripture as, as a spiritual gift from God to encourage others um, and let them know that God is present in, in the Holy Spirit. It, it, and it causes a commotion, understandably. Uh, and when people uh, go to check out what they hear, uh, they don't hear a strange language. They hear their own. And remember, everyone is here from all over, all the different provinces of the Roman Empire. They're back in Jerusalem. And what we see is if Christ is Lord, then he's beginning to unify his church in this moment. Everyone is, is unified in the same spirit. This doesn't happen without the Spirit of God pulling off a miracle in this moment. And so it's the birth of the church, and the church has never been alone since. And I love that last part. 
Or people thought everyone was drunk. It's understandable. Um, when the church does weird things, people on the outside look back and go, what are you doing? Um, but check out Peter's response. So verse 14, it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. He said, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Good, they have standards. Um, now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he goes on to, to quote the Old Testament in verse 22. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God by you, uh, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death and nailed him on a cross. But God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then verse 32, it says, God has raised this Jesus to life. We are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see now and hear. Peter says, look, we aren't drunk. Something has happened to us. More accurately, someone has happened to us. Jesus was special from the beginning. He was here. He lived among us. He did many wonderful things. We put him on a cross and we killed him, but he didn't stay dead. In fact, he's freed from the agony of defeat. And now that same spirit that did that is now here with us. And it changes us. And it can change you too. If Christ was Peter's Lord, then he just proclaimed power and glory to all who would hear. And at the end of the chapter, um, the church kind of concludes with what the church does next. And so if Christ is their Lord, then they proclaim God's power and glory by doing this. Verse 42 it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If Christ is their Lord, then they proclaimed God's glory and power by doing a few things, by seeking knowledge, by seeking truth, by worshiping, by practicing hospitality, by serving each other, by being generous, and by practicing evangelism. And I think, though, I don't think, I know those things are still available to us. Um, those things haven't changed in 2,000 years. So if Christ is Lord, then Harbor Covenant, we can seek after truth. We can seek after knowledge. So study the Bible. Get in a small group. Find a mentor. Seek after what is true in this universe uh, and in your life. Worship with us on Sunday mornings. If, 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 if Christ is Lord, then worship. Um, we invite you. Make it a priority for yourself and your families. If Christ is Lord, then practice hospitality. Be a greeter or an usher on Sunday morning. Sign up to run the kitchen. Uh, just invite people over to your home and share a meal together. It communicates that you see value in an individual and a human being created by God. If Christ is Lord, then serve other people. Get to know people different than you. Pray for God to open your eyes to issues that you can contribute to the solution. Sure, gathering supplies and donating money is great, but also give of your time and of your emotions and of your sweat and of your tears. Risk your own prosperity for the prosperity of others. If Christ is Lord, then be generous. Be a giver. God's a giver, and we should be too. Tithe to the church. Give to World Vision. Help out with a cause that you believe in. Help a kid get through college. Pay for a meal. Don't just drive past a person on the street. Um, be generous. If Christ is Lord, then, then evangelize. This one's hard. But share the good news that's within you. Heck, we share the good news about the deals we find at Kohl's, the weight loss programs that we have, or even special events in the harbor. Your chains are broken. That's a much better and more powerful message to share. There's this one phrase called preach the gospel always and if necessary use words. It's normally ascribed to St. Francis of Assisi. 
probably didn't say it, and there's no real record of it anyways, and I think we've actually hid behind it because we're like, okay, well, I don't have to say anything if I just act good. No, not, not what we read in Scripture. You actually have to use your mouth and say words and tell other people about what God has done for you. Um, use your words. That's right. So here's some homework for you. Finish this sentence for yourself. If Christ is my Lord, then I... What is, what is God calling you to as a response? As a church, here are some suggestions. If Christ is Lord, then we must find and acknowledge God's power at work in our life. If Christ is Lord, then we must glorify him more than the other things that we do. If Christ is Lord, then, then we need to be reading what's in the Bible because that's where we find truth. If Christ is Lord, then, then we need to make worshiping with him a priority. Now, I know some of you might still be stuck on that if Christ is Lord part, and that's, that's fine. I hope you're wrestling with that. That's something that you're figuring out, and you're not alone. In fact, ever since Christ came, people have been wrestling with that is, is Christ Lord decision. Um, but, but if you agree that the Christ is Lord part, if you follow with us the whole holy night, you've, you've realized that, that people are broken and in need of fixing. That's something we can all generally agree to. We also realize that people can't fix themselves we come close sometimes, but fully, we don't. We're also doomed to hurt each other and ourselves until something frees us. And yet, we celebrate Christ as someone who has that power to do that thing that we can't. So if that's you and you're still figuring that out, I encourage you to, to, to consider those things. Um, and even if you look back at your life and you're like, I don't think God has ever showed up in my life once, ever, I would say, look again. Um, because he is at work whether you realize it or not. The, the, the hymn that we put together, that, that, we, that we walked through, was put together by a man that, that really didn't, wasn't, had, a, had a lot of faith, um, and then walked away from the faith. It was put to song by, by someone that didn't even believe Christ was Lord. Um, it was outlawed. It, was, it became this great thing in the, in the abolitionist movement in America. It was sung over the radio waves. you got to say, that there's some kind of power in that. So look back in your life and go, maybe that was God at work. Something good that happened to you or something that set your course for the better. And maybe, just maybe, it's this moment right now where God is tugging on your heart and you're like, maybe this is the power of God speaking to me. So if Christ is Lord, if Christ is my Lord, then you have to figure that out. So I want you to think about that one and these three questions. Where have you seen evidence of God's power at work in your life and in, others, and in other people's lives? What areas of your life are you stuck worshiping the power and work of someone other than Jesus? And three, how can you participate in the mission of the church? For example, worship, evangelism, discipleship, service, generosity, hospitality. Take a few moments to consider those things. Third, you did something amazing for us. And your power is great, and you're worthy of our praise. God, I, I, I pray for us this morning that you would help us examine our life and look back and even look to, to the present, too, and, uh, and open our eyes to what you've done and what you're doing. And may that inspire us. May that, may that do something in us that changes us and, uh, and causes us to, to give you the glory in, in all the different ways that, that you've allowed for us to do in the history of the church. Um, guide us from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen.